Welcome everyone. Um, closed captioning is available in today's webinar by selecting the closed caption icon at the lower right of your screen. Since this is an automated service, we apologize in advance for any errors in transcription. There will be ASL interpreters on screen with us throughout this program. And today's session will be recorded and available on the Teach-In website soon. So um, I just like to introduce myself. I am Latanya Asatri, and I'm joining you today from the ancestral lands of the Erie and Haudenosaunee people. And this is in the area that is at the moment known as Cleveland, Ohio. I am a cultural organizer in the arts, and I also work as the gun curator in residence at MOCA Cleveland. And some of you may know me through association um, with the Museums Are Not Neutral Global Initiative that basically exposes the fallacies of the museum neutrality claim, and it calls for an equity-based transformation of museums. This teach-in, Art of Collective Care and Responsibility, Handling Images of Black Suffering and Death, is part of one of my latest liberatory curatorial projects, the Black Liberation Center, which is an experimental series of exhibitions, workshops, and programming that spotlights art and culture that envision and strategize paths toward the freedom of all Black people, and thus all people. This Black Liberation Center program is an intervention from the ongoing institutional disregard, the anti-Blackness of museums, the anti-Blackness of this world. The program is in association with MOCA Cleveland and the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center. So I have shared a little bit about myself um, but before we get going, I'd like to get to know a little bit about you. So we have a quick poll that we're going to put up on the screen um, for you to fill out. And here you go. Uh, we'd like to take a minute to respond here. You see the questions. Um, the first one is, which of these roles best describe you? You can pick more than one. And our second question, when you scroll down a little bit, is say, are you affiliated with an institution that posted a quote solidarity statement um, following the global uprisings in the wake of the murder of George Floyd? So please take a moment to respond to those two questions and we'll get back to you in about a minute. Okay, it looks like we have um, our results are in and just looking at these quickly, it looks like we have a bunch of different um, folks here, which is great. And most of them, uh, the majority seem like they're coming from kind of the museum field. So that's interesting. And we have um, quite a few artists and teachers here today, um, writers, so just, you know, a, a range of folks, which is really wonderful. And wow, looking at this question about the solidarity statement. So a lot of places in terms of the people who are here today, um, most of you are affiliated with some type of an institution that did post a solidarity statement. So that's really interesting. I'm thinking we we're gonna talk a little bit about these kind of solidarity statements a little bit in our roundtable discussion today. Um, so thank you for doing that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and close the poll. You can close that on your screen. And um, welcome everybody to this rupture. This is a rupture from the status quo, as I was telling you. And this teaching is really for all of us because um, thinking carefully before distributing any type of images of black suffering and death is really vital for fighting anti-black racism and really creating a culture of collective care. We're gonna talk about what that means, collective care. We have a host of fantastic people here with us today. Our ASL interpreters are Rachel Perota, Patty Bettis Eddy. We have a musical guest who will be joining us at the um, latter, part of the, latter part of the program. Um, Casey Barger, Cleveland musician. He's gonna share his magic with us later. Uh, my co-moderator, Kijo Lee, will be joining us in just a moment and will introduce herself and all of our brilliant roundtable discussants. Um, first, I'd like to set the stage for today's discussion a little bit. So um, I wanna share a quote from Christina Sharp. And some of you do know that um, Dr. Christina Sharp was at our she was our keynote speaker and she was at our round table one, our first round table last Friday. So this is from her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being. What does it mean to defend the dead? To tend to the black dead and dying, to tend to the black body, 
to black people always living in the push toward our death. It means work. It is work, hard, emotional, physical, and intellectual work that demands vigilant attendance to the needs of the dying to ease their way and also to the needs of the living. So this work is what we're going to discuss today. Following our previous week's roundtable, Black trauma, death and death imagery is always spectacle. This discussion today, um, developing a practice of collective care is going to consider the methods that Black artists, curators, educators, and organizers use to center the well-being of Black people, of victims, of those most harmed. Our focus is on collective care and liberation, which really requires a communal resistance and a communal imagining. And um, those of us who are paying attention, we know that you know, social violence requires a social and collective response. We acknowledge the precarious and we acknowledge the precariousness and the possibilities of liberatory projects due to the existing brutal asymmetry of power as termed by Saidia Hartman in Scenes of Subjection. So today is about the extreme challenges and yet the soulful replenishing aspects of this work. We are going to consider three themes, our theories, frameworks, the things that sustain the work of caring for black people, the actual methods that we use to center the well being of Black people via visual culture, and imagining and building Black futures. And before we get going with our um, roundtable discussion, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Amy Meredith Cox, whose life practice is a wonderful example of how to keep our minds, our hearts, and bodies connected. In addition to being a professor in the departments of African American Studies and Anthropology at Yale University, she is um, also a former professional dancer, a yogi, and so much more. So welcome, Amy. Thank you so much, Latanya. Thank you for that. And it's so good to be back with you all again here this week for this, this kind of second stage of this incredible intervention. And so what, what I'm here to do is essentially to welcome us to this space officially, to allow us to land here, to arrive here. And so, so what I'm hoping is that we can arrive and really land fully present so that we can listen with an openness and receptivity so that we can speak from a place that is grounded and true and so that we can really occupy this, this virtual landscape together fully. And so before we, we begin any meditative process, I think it's hugely important to clear, to clear. So before we can kind of settle and land within the space of our own bodies, we kind of have to shed a little bit. So I wanna take us through, and some of you have done this before, a shedding, a release, and then a, a little bit of a dry shower to kind of clear our energy in our space so that we can, we can be fully present with ourselves and with one another, right? So the first thing I like to do, because we gather energies throughout the day, throughout the month, throughout our lives that don't actually belong to us, and so I just like to do this. It's almost like you're, you can imagine like you're flinging water from your fingers, but you're really allowing yourself to release, ha, ah, fully release any kind of energy or feeling or residue that needs to go, needs to shed. So just take a few minutes and it doesn't have to look like what I'm doing. I clearly have a lot that I wanna to release today, but allow yourself to kind of feel a vibration through your body and allow yourself to ha ah, release. You might even vocalize a little bit. I guess I'm feeling some kind of way today. And then settle and you might notice like a tingling, like a residue of like a release and opening some spaciousness. And then we'll take a dry shower, which is simply what it says. It's a clearing, you're using your own hands on your body to release like a last bit of clearing. Mm. And I'd like to visualize as I'm doing this, so it's not just an action, but I'm really seeing that residue um, the energy that I don't need. Sometimes it's stories that we hold on to. We need to let them go. Feel yourself ha, getting that stuff up off you. Ha, let it go. Ha, and then we arrive, we settle. So here in your seat, I want you to really feel today your feet connecting to the ground beneath you. So really like even stomp your feet a few times so you can feel that connection to the ground. And then your second connection is through your through your seat, through your sits bones. Feel yourself connecting to your chair or to the floor. 
so that your spine can be long and easeful. Relax your hands. And today I'd like you to have your palms up, relaxed fingers on your thighs or on, if you have a desk in front of you, just let your hands land. And without needing to do anything fancy or difficult, I just want you to feel your breath. Just as it is right now, just feel its pathway through your body. Feel where it's creating some space, especially on that inhale, the spaciousness through the breath that moves through the body. And you might feel the exhale as a kind of a, a, a softening, a sort of a, a, a soft surrender. So the inhale is an expansion outward and the exhale kind of as a gathering back in. We're gonna take about a minute of what I call heart grounded breathing today. So just stay with your breath, stay as you are, I'll describe it to you. On your next inhale, I'd like you to imagine the inhale emerging from the ground, from the soles of your feet, traveling through your body to your heart, it's full inhale. And the exhale, gathering that energy back in from your heart and then grounding all the way back down to the soles of your feet. Uh-huh, so the inhale is a drawing up from the earth, full inhale all the way to the heart. And the exhale, gathering back in from the heart, grounding back down through the body to the feet. Mm -hmm. Try it a few more times, breathing in, draw the breath in, feel the breath travel through the body to the heart space. Exhale, feel that same energy grounding back down to the soles of your feet. You can close your eyes and feel this in your own body, full inhale, feel the breath emerge from the ground up, travel through the body. Then the exhale, come back into the body and ground you back down and settle through the feet, connecting back to the earth. Inhale, full expansion, moving through the body, out through the heart. Exhale, back into the heart through the body, grounding through the feet. Try a few more on your own. Full inhale, grounding exhale. If it helps, you can place a hand right over your heart so you can feel your heartbeat and also facilitate this movement, this breathing from the heart to the feet, from the feet to the heart as you feel the breath passing through your body. Inhale is an expansion outward and the exhale is a re-grounding, resettling through the body. Relax your face, relax your jaw and just breathe here for just a few more rounds. And see if you can visualize that pathway of the breath from the earth to the heart and then from the exhale, the heart back to the earth, grounding you, centering you, bringing you here into this space. It's a few more full rounds here. Feeling and seeing the breath as it moves. Full spacious inhale, sweet. Grounding, exhale. And then if you don't already have one hand on your heart, I'm gonna ask you to place that open palm at your heart, feeling your heartbeat beating into your hand. And take your other hand and just place it on top of that hand and just add a gentle pressure to the heart. Just a reminder here of that fundamental rhythm of your heartbeat beating into your own hands and connecting to that rhythm of your breath, that, that steady ebb and flow of your breath. If you're feeling unsettled or unmoored or anxious at any point, you can always come back right here, hands to heart, feeling the heartbeat and connecting back to the fullness of your inhale and the sweet surrender and grounding of your exhale. If your eyes are closed, you can just reopen. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cox, for sharing your grounding practices with us um, each and every time. It's been um, very stabilizing, at least for me. Um, and I just want to welcome everyone uh, to our roundtable this afternoon. I'm Kijo Lee. Um, I'm currently the Assistant Director of Academic Affairs at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, but I am also um, a, a, a scholar, museum educator. I'm a PhD candidate currently in the History of Art and African American Studies departments um, at Yale, but also have curated independently, acted as an independent critic. So come into this conversation from a variety of entry points. Um, and so before we begin our panel, I would love to introduce each of our panelists. Um, and I'll begin with Sheila Pretty Bright, who is an acclaimed international photographic artist who portrays large scale works that combine a wide range um, knowledge of contemporary culture. She's known for her series Invisible Empire, uh, uh, 1960 Now and Young Americans among others. Um, Sheila is the recipient of several nominations and awards. Recently, she's been awarded the commission for Picturing the South by the High Museum of Art um, and Boston University uh, Memorial Library, uh, a commission and a multimedia installation titled Rebirth. Next, um, I'd like to introduce Amanda D. King. Amanda is a Cleveland-based artist, activist, and educator. Um, her civically engaged practice utilizes law, art history, and photography to spread progressive ideas through visual language and cultural organizing. Amanda is also the creative director of Shooting Without Bullets, a four impact organization using cultural production, artist education and development, activism and advocacy to model an alternative arts ecosystem that accelerates movement, black and brown youth and their communities need to thrive. Next, Dr. Isetta Autumn Mobley. Um, uh, who is a native Washingtonian and graduate of Brown. Um, she completed her doctoral studies at the University of Maryland College Park in American Studies. Her research focuses on race, disability, slavery, public history, digital humanities, and material and visual culture. She is a 2020 American Council of Learned Scholars Emerging Voices Fellow at the University of Texas, Austin. Next, we have Dr. Kelly Morgan who is a curator, author, educator, and activist who specializes in critical race curatorial analyses. Her interdisciplinary work demonstrates how traditional art history and museum practice work specifically to uphold white supremacy and maintain white cultural hegemony. She's held multiple curatorial positions, um, including uh, the Indianapolis Museum of Art and New Fields, where she recontextualized American collections to illuminate systemic racism and institutional inequities. Currently, Dr. Morgan is an independent curator and art consultant. And um, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Teresa Rayford. Um, who is the founder of Don't Shoot Portland, a Black-led uh, excuse me, a Black-led and community-driven nonprofit in Portland, Oregon, that advocates for accountability to create social change in spaces of racial justice and law enforcement accountability. Since George Floyd's murder and following uprising, Teresa has been on the forefront um, filing a class action lawsuit against the city of Portland and suing the Trump administration for the federal response of those defending the general populace's right to protest. In July, Don't Shoot Portland was archived into the Library of Congress as a significant documentation of anti-racism work in American history. Um, I hope you'll all well, uh, join me in welcoming our panelists. And I also have the honor of kicking off our discussion. So thinking about, I'm always uh, moved not only to consider my practice, but to evolve and adapt that practice in conversation with others um, uh, and to um, ex 
to also think about how we narrativize, how we tell the story of our practice. Mm -hmm. And so to that end, what we'd like to ask each of our panelists to respond to is what principles, what thinking, beliefs, or frameworks works are your guides, are your touchstones? What do you return to over and over again? Um, and anything is welcome here, particular books, theories, you know, your grandmother, your family, whatever helps you understand your work and its place in the world. And so I'd like to um, start with Sheila, if we could, if you could tell us a little bit about the, the kind of touchstones that you return to again and again um, as you uh, create your work. Hey everyone, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> unmute. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and the question that you propose to all of us um, for me is very, very important really at this critical time in our country. Um, I've been doing, with my practice, I've been really looking at trauma through my work and I'm looking at it, how it influenced us as black bodies is concerned and resistance. A lot of the books that I'm reading right now, since um, my medium is photography, is decolonizing the camera and how, how me as a woman and an African-American woman, how can I decolonize the camera based on imagery that we have grown up on or seen through the white male narrative? And I've been pondering a lot on that and thinking a lot about mothers and thinking about daughters of enslaved. Thank you so much for that, um, Sheila. I think it's essential when we think about even the technologies that we use in our work and how they are not neutral. I always return to Richard Dyer's White to think about mm -hmm. the camera itself, right? Mm -hmm. The inherent um, racism of the technology itself. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Mobley, would you please respond to the same question? Sort of what do you return to again and again as a touchstone um, in your work? Um, so I think that for me, there is a Lucille Clifton poem, which if you've ever done any work with me, um, you will hear me often repeat that poem, um, which is celebrate, uh, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. So that's a poem that I think about a lot, and particularly the lines in the poem that say, um, between starshine and clay. So I think I often return to that poetry, but also that poem as a map for survival. Um, I think I often also think about Toni Morrison's work in Beloved, where she's describing this hush harbor, um, and there's this speech about we we flesh, right? We flesh, feel your feel your arm, feel your hand, feel your heartbeat, which. Um, reminds me so much of what Dr. Cox was just doing with us, right? This reparative work of reminding ourselves to be in our bodies and that our bodies can be a safe harbor, even amidst incredible violence against those bodies. Um, I think often, obviously, of the work of Christina Sharp, Sadia Hartman, and there's a quote that often just stays with me um, that comes from a scholar named Avery Gordon, who talks about doing the work out of a concern for justice. Um, and sort of thinking about the ghostly matter and residue of uh, the violences that are ongoing, but also thinking about doing this work out of a place and concern for justice. And I think those are the touchstones that I return to over and over again. Um, and Octavia Butler, of course, reminding us that change is that one constant. So I find that I'm often returning to those thinkers. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I also hear in your response this, uh, the way in which those uh, thinkers and artists stage kind of ancestral and elemental returns, all of them um, uh, thinking about the matter. Avery Gordon was 
maybe one of my first inspirations for the kind of work I do investigating that material. What is the matter of that ghostly presence or that absence? So thank you so much um, for that. And again, uh, we will return to our uh, panelists and maybe uh, Teresa, if you'd like to respond to the same question. Thank you, Dr. Moses. I was trying to send a text to my son to tell the kids to stop bouncing. I have my grandkids over. <laughs> um, so if you hear any noise, it's just them. I was like, oh no, I'm gonna have this question. Um, yeah. I, um, I come from a place, I, I grew up in foster care and the people that I was able to count on in my community were my grandparents and a lot of their friends. And when they would talk to me about growing up, um, you know, in post-slavery America, which now I'm, I'm reminded through the work that I do that we're still in that time. Um, <clears throat> it, it gave me courage because I couldn't believe and I was inspired by the courage that they showed in utilizing their humanity to still make it through. They weren't talking about being apologizing for being black or trying to assimilate. Um, they talked about the real overcoming, being destined and being encouraged to move forward. And so um, and growing up, getting that type of reality, even in the circumstance that I was in, uh, going from place to place in foster care, um, having those reminders, being able to document those conversations, being able to document images and stories or research things that they would talk to me about, it gave me the framework that anthropology and society and the events that occur in society, that if we're reminded um, about those events and what, you know, came into play to make them occur, um, that would also be reminded that there is a spirit in which, you know, we can handle those situations. And so um, I've always thrived on that as far as my journey and the work that I do. I'm, you know, I'm a community organizer and activist, but I do pull from the threads of our past in order to build complete focus and resolution moving forward. Thank you so much for that. And I think we'll be talking a little bit more um, later on about right, having that intimate relationship with the stories of endurance, with those histories, um, but in that, in that incredibly direct and intimate way and how that can inform the work that we do, no matter what realm right, that we are um, engaging um, uh, in. Um, and so uh, Dr. Morgan, I ask you the same question, please. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I respond to and return to a lot of the same, you know, scholars and um, artists, you know, mentioned here. I'm, I'm scrolling around on my laptop to pull up some quotes now. But um, for me, there's a couple, you know, for me, it's Toni Morrison, um, Sula, you know, the quote that um, where Sula says, I don't want to make somebody else, you know, I want to make myself, you know, so this whole idea that of women, you know, have a kid and you'll be happy. Um, you know, um, Angela, not, An well, yeah, Angela Davis has a quote that I kind of have lived by in the last, re you know, maybe six or seven years. Um, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the, transform the world and you have to do it all the time. Um, that's kind of a mantra for me you know, um, Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, both the collection as well as the essay itself, you know, so the histories of Black women, you know, making something out of nothing and making beauty, you know, where we are. Um, you know, Audre Lorde and her work about, you know, doing what has to be done um, and, and the, the idea of not doing so, you know, and how that sort of a, um, creates a different kind of death, you know, when you don't address the things that you know needs to be addressed. Um, and something that's just come to me recently, you know, that I'll share here today um, is hip hop has been, you know, a, a framework for me too, or like a kind of guidebook for me. Um, there are, you know, two lines in specific, you know, specifically um, by Jay-Z that I've always kind of held close to me, you know, and particularly in regards to fighting white supremacy. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's what he means, you know, in using the lines, but it definitely, um, both of these lines, you know, there's one on his first album, he has a song with Ben Bleak where he says, you know, you let your shit bubble quietly and then you blow and keep it cool. You know, and then there's, and so it's like that kind of being under the radar, you know, under a, a not allowing, because my grandmother would say, not allowing your left hand to know what your right hand is doing. 
Um, and that's been really helpful to me, <laughs> you know, in these violent white institutions I've worked in for the last six years. Um, and then the last one, you know, is, is the one that I will um, stop with, because this literally just came to me a couple of days ago, which I hadn't thought about, but it was a, it's the line in Upgrade You with Beyonce, where he says, I'd be the D-boy that infiltrated all the corporate dudes. They call shots I call audibles. And I was like, you know, and that's what, you know, at least for me, that's what I've been doing for the last six years of my life, you know, is in, of my career, you know, is calling these audibles, you know, um, in the midst, you know, of institutional logistics, right, or, or, or racist, you know, just egregiously um, patriarchal and sexist, <laughs> you know, structural procedure you know, where I will call the audible and the, you know, right on the, the sort of line of scrimmage um, and change the play and then and then actually change the outcome, you know, in in a way that the institution did not necessarily expect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, thinking about that variety of sources, thinking about like how hip hop teaches us how to lie in the cut. That's the first yes. thing that occurred to me. Um, <laughs> um, and how to sort of stay there, um, but also bringing up these ideas about legibility, right? So how, how do you in those corporate spaces call the audible without necessarily relying, right, on making yourself legible in those traditional meaning white masculine ways, right? And so I, I, that's also, I think, a part of my own practice. So I'd be really interested in us talking a bit more about that um, as we move forward. Um, so thank you so much for that, Dr. Morgan. And then um, last but certainly not least, if we could hear from you, Amanda, um, about uh, uh, your touchstones in your, in your multiple practices. Absolutely. Well, mostly everybody touched on, on my sort of go-tos. Um, Toni Morrison and Christina Sharp definitely are, are very high on that list. Susan Sontag on The Pain of Others is, is, is definitely a, a wonderful text to read on this subject matter. But I guess I will go back to Toni Morrison's Beloved. And, and, and just, I think that a lot of my frameworks are learned in academic spaces, but a space that I also grew up in was the Black church. And the Black church teaching you about relationships, teaching you about, you know, Black people's struggles and how there is liberation in our theology, that is very important to me. And so um, just thinking about Beloved and Baby Sugg's theological praxis, right? And, and I love this quote that Morrison, when she talks about um, baby Suggs being in the clearing and the clearing being that space where Black folks go to imagine, they go to purge, um, you know, purge the, the racial terror and the violence that they experience every day. They go there to love, to dance, to be together. And, um, you know, Morrison basically says that Baby Suggs, you know, did not tell the people in the clearing that they were the blessed of the earth. It's inheriting meek or it's glory bound pure. She told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine. And if they could not see it, they could not have it. And so like that radical imagination is so important to us as black and brown people, to me as a black artist, is that we are, power concedes nothing, right? And so we have to imagine our own liberation and we have to see it for ourselves and in our daily practices, engage it. Like, retool it, reimagine it, but we have to do this constantly and consistently because if we can't see it, truly we can't have it. Mm. Thank you for that, Amanda. Yes, and I think that is a unifying thread through each panelist's response, that idea of the radical imagination, right? So what is it? Which I think leads us to um, a conversation that we'll have about what it is that artworks are asking of us. Right? How 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 are we encountering those reimaginings or imagining utterly otherwise? I think in in the ways that these words tend to enter the vernacular, even reimagining somehow feels a little bit tight 
to me um, at this moment. But um, I, um, I think that we've touched on everyone's sort of touchstones at this moment. So I want to turn it over to, um, to Latanya, but also open it up such that if you, any of you have responses to someone else's um, response to that first question, please feel free. But I will first um, turn it over to Latanya. Thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you. I just love this rich discussion. I was taking all kind of notes. I love um, everything that everyone said. And I have to say, I mean, I have a, you know, a favorite. I have favorites, you know, Toni Morrison is a big one for me. So it's really wonderful to hear that resonating over and over, but really all of these people. And what I hear too is, this is a lot of black women in here, right? That have been doing this, this work um, and really showing us about the, what freedom is and about loving black folks. and. Um, we have a panel of black women here today too. And so, let, you know, just saying, just saying, uh, we are been, we've been doing this work of imagining um, ourselves and caring for our black community all the time. So it's really wonderful to be with all of you and having this. I wanted to talk um, a little bit more about your practice. And here I'm thinking if we could get more into the specifics about how you center black folks in your work, how you refuse anti-blackness, and here I'd like us also to kind of mention some of those challenges to that focus, especially if you're, you know, well, all of us are living in an anti-Black world, just saying, but some of us live in, um, or are working at institutions that are very highly violent and are very much wedded to um, their anti-Blackness. So I'd like to actually talk about some of those challenges and how we, how you, how we keep going. Sure, I can start, Latanya, um, you know, just to, to start us off. Um, for me, the it's so funny to me now, um, you know, like maybe four or five months out, you know, from my resignation, um, you know, from IMA, because my approach to American art is literally like centered in a, a Christina Sharp quote, <laughs> you know, and every anytime I talk about, you know, um, my approach to American art, you know, I always start, you know, with that quote, and it's the quote, um, I forget what chapter it's in where she's talking about how do we memorialize, right? The, um, how do we, and if, if museums are to kind of set up this kind of space of beauty, you know, for things that um, are in the past, right? It's like, how do we memorialize something like transatlantic slavery? And then I would add, you know, indigenous genocide when, you know, talking about American art that are still ongoing. Um, and it's weird how, you know, white audiences, white institutions will receive that. It's like, oh, this is like a cool kind of thing to do, you know? And then when it comes down to actually doing the work, you know, it becomes a completely different game, right? So, you know, for one, um, in terms of to answer, you know, your question directly, like how our center black people is it comes from a black lens. Um, so I always say, you know, you don't always need you know, black art to tell a black story. Um, and I'm doing something, I'm doing that purposely because I'm always trying to use sort of works by historic white artists um, to demonstrate how the erasure takes place, why it's taken place and why it has remained as such. Um, and then the second thing, you know, then how do I combat anti-blackness is when the, so in the IMA's case, you know, once the institution responded, you know, un, unwilling, right, to do the internal work that needed to happen to hold a show or to hold a reinstallation that would, in, that would completely implicate them. Um, I was like, you can't, you know, then you can't have any of it. You can't have me, you can't have the work, you can't have the communities that I have been working with, you can't have the, the loans that have come in since I have been here, you know, you know I, I remove all of it, you know, from the space. Um, and that's just one, you know, of, of several different strategies. But I've come to understand that sometimes the, reg the resignation is kind of part of the work as well. Yes, thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, that refusal is what you're talking yeah. about, right? You're right, and you and that that takes a lot of um, you know belief in yourself, and it takes so I think sometimes a while to build that up for yourself to to say, you know, I'm going to refuse because the systems that we are trained in tell us everything about we supposed to be in there and assimilate and yeah. go along with that violence, right? And and it's you know you know what it is like, right, Kelly? You know, it's retaliatory. It's yeah. real. It's the real yeah. I can't lie. You know, I mean, I was scared. You know, <laughs> you know, the first 
two months, I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to work again. You know, <laughs> um, It's scary. But like Audrey Lord says, it's like, it would have been a much greater depth, mm-hmm. you know, if had I not said something, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm sure, you know, our, our other colleagues, you know, who are doing this work, whether it's in academia or, or museums, you know, or galleries, you know, for the artists who are here, you know, it's the same thing. And, um, and you know, like Amanda said, we have to do it, you know, every day. Every day. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you. I can't wait to hear some more thoughts from other folks here. I can I can chime in. Um, you know, I think that a lot of this year has taught us that like black folks are not a monolith and actually in the controversy with Mocha that was expressed and it's true that we're not uh, a monolith, but we are connected. Um, through ancestry and we are connected because of the hold and because of our experiences with structural racism. And so I believe that that everyone in the struggle should should be supported and encouraged to um, to participate in, in our collective salvation and liberation. Mm-hmm. And it's very important for me as an educator and artist to understand that movement has many there's many roles that you can play in movement and each and every one of us needs to understand the roles that we play in our own liberation. We need to organize ourselves, our resources, our knowledge, our networks, and then we need to be held accountable for when we do things that harm the liberation of ourselves and and others. And a lot of times people use this idea, well, well, I'm not, I'm not speaking for every Black person, but, what, but when we do something that is antithetical to anti-racist and liberation movement, it affects all of us. And I think that like in movement, care plays a profound role because that's how we build relationship with each other. And in, the, in movements where there is absence of care, we reinforce anti-Blackness and we impede progress. And so as Black artists, we really truly have to understand that our artistic expression has to have care within it because um, that work will not influence movement if it is anti-Black. Thank you, Amanda. That was so expertly put. And I love that you brought that connection between art and activism, like the real work. You know, we know a lot of institutions and some artists are saying that their work is about equity, their work is about anti-racism. I don't know. It's something to say right now because it's trendy. I I hate to say it, but I do think that's a lot of it. It's trendy and it's a way to get funding Um, because when you see a lack of care for actual people that are the ones that are most harmed, how is your work about equity? How is your work about anti-racism, right? So yes, there's something really wrong. And I think you put that so beautifully. I'm wondering if Sheila or Teresa um, in particular, just picking up on these threads that Amanda has put out here and Kelly, um, I just feel like there must be something y'all got here. Um, I'll I'll speak. Um, From a standpoint as an artist, um, for me, and this is just based on my experience, is I know you guys were talking about the museums and anti-Blackness. But for me, I've always took a stand in my work and what I wanted to do. And when it came to galleries or museums, I didn't feel that I had to portray work to get it into the museums. I'm standing on my own. And with that, as of today, I've never had gallery representation. And who really helped me in my career is people like you that are on the panel. And I I feel that as an artist, you have to take a stand. And and for me, I had to take a stand because I had to do what came out of me and my experience. I mean, I'm talking about my experience as a, a Black, if I could say it like this, as a Black body. But I'm really talking about universal commonality and people can't get past that at all. And so right now, I'm really thinking about how we read and see imagery because like I said before, I didn't tell you the name of the book that I was reading is called Decolonizing the Camera, Photography and Radical Times by Mark Mark Seeley. 
I just feel that for me as a uh, image maker, I'm, I'm trying to get it out because I'm, I'm talking slow. Um, as an image maker, we have all learned of ourselves through the colonizer. So who do we? And so I'm rethinking that. And how do I elevate that? Okay. Because a lot of times in the museums, if it's not, if I could say it like this, a stereotype of us, they don't want it. And I give you a good example of a body of a work that I call Suburbia in 2006. In between those years, 2005 and 2008, you had what was going on in the art world was Suburbia, Suburbia, Suburbia. I wanted to talk about um, the invisibility of African Americans in suburbia, because we always point our camera into urban America. I won a major award, and I had to let photographers, not photographers, um, curators, photo editors, publishers look at the work. One common thing that they told me that I did not have enough signifiers in that work to show that these were black homes, number one. Mm. Number two, I never heard of your suburbia. And that, it was like, I was like, as an artist, I'm like, I live like this. We're in the 21st century. And that, that, that negative stereotype unconsciously is in their mind. It's like, I don't see anything in your work. Mm -hmm. A gallery owner out of New York told me, what we want you to do is be nude and put chains on you and stuff like that. So I, as an artist, had to take a stand. And now since George Floyd, everybody wants to amplify Black blackness okay and that really upset me i really kind of went off on a lot of um museum people um public relations people and I'm like why now why as you said now that. <laughs> as you said that, Sheila. You yeah know. so i don't know i'm really thinking about how i as an artist can elevate that conversation through my imagery and now i'm taking it through the landscape. And it's all, always been about the land and the relationship with black bodies to the land. So that's where I'm moving on to to see if I can elevate that narrative. Thank you, Sheila. That was, that, that's all of it. Thank you for just putting <laughs> that clearly, right? Thank you. We know that everybody want to amplify some black artists all of a sudden. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I said, uh, um, Autumn, please, please join us here. Yes. Um, well, I was going to say I agree with Sheila because all of a sudden it did just happen. And um, one of the things that was in the chat, it said that capitalism relies on, you know, on anti-Blackness. And that is a fact. I think that because of COVID and the inequities that we all uh, saw, witnessed, and had to correspond with during our quarantine, that at the time of the uprising, that they knew that there was going to be fractions of people that had never been on the front line with a Black Lives Matter movement, um, because that movement intersected into their lives because of the inequities of COVID and because of the situation we all found ourselves in. Um, and I think that one of the things that capitalistic uh, sy systems do is they try to figure out how do we protect ourselves? How do we defend ourselves? And so grabbing a Black Lives Matter sign like they do in Portland and sticking it in the front yard or putting the panels um, intentionally on your building and hiring Black artists at a very low rate where you know that they're still suffering from the inequities of uh, COVID, um, it, it is, it's fake, it's false, it's a Band-Aid, but it actually occurred. And when you saw the systems align themselves with politicians that had never responded Responded to the outcry from the activist community, um, participating and even venturing to build their own uh, events and, and programming and putting, you know, murals on the streets and everything, um, kneeling and hugging police officers, okay, all of that was production propaganda. We all knew it and seen it, felt it. And those of us who had been calling it out for so long, um, witnessing it and seeing people take in this venture and, and support it, it, it just was hard. It, that was PTSD for me, because I was like, for all this time, 
that we've called this out and for all the inequities that you're still suffering from, you will take the propaganda. It works. Um, capitalism does rely on the anti-Blackness. And if they can buy into incorporating what diversity should look like and you know, make it look like it's equality, then that's what they're masters of. Um, and we take that as well, but we have to start um, not relying on that, you know? <laughs> One of the reasons that I even started working with the museum was because we knew this on the front lines, we knew this. And I knew this because it was a safety issue when we would protest with families, unless we had beautiful artwork um, people would want to injure us. They would want to harm us intentionally and immediately. And so we started building out the artwork. We started putting on, you know, t-shirts. We started being more intentional about the signage and the communication because we felt that art could protect us. Um, we felt that you can't control art. That even people that didn't agree with our protests might say, hey, they're expressing themselves and that's a protected form of free speech and it's an artistic expression. Look at what they're doing. Um, th that was just hopefully our entitlements because we felt like we didn't have any other protections, um, but it did work. It, it gave us an opportunity um, to you know, build a relationship with the museum based on the terms that we wanted. But once we got into the door and said, hey, all black people gotta be free you know, to come in here, you can't be charging them. Um, no, we don't want a code. No, we don't want a ticket, um, but we still wanna come in and you should need to figure it out because you got the resources, but we're not doing it. I mean, it, it, it seemed as if it was working and then we saw the infraction. We saw where they would you know, build in these big exhibits with artists that didn't align with the things that we were doing, but they would invite us to come and, you know, like participate in the pictures and Latanya knows. And I was happy when Latanya showed up because they were able to sit there on that full stage and call all the bullshit out. Um, and it helped us because we were only being invited in little bits and pieces at this time. So it was like, dang, we stringing on for life. Why are we even showing up? Because this is somebody whose communication asset is something that we can campaign on. Um, so we're, we're counting on the work that y'all are doing and we will back it up, but if we don't work like, like I think Dr. Amanda said, intentional um, and intersectional, then it's not going to be enough. Oh my gosh, this is such a rich conversation. It's like, I, I have to participate. I can't just listen. This is so, so rich and, and incredible. Um, and everything that has been said has just, I'm trying to take notes and it's incredible. Um, I, Latanya, I think I go back to something that you had written, which is the meticulous work of centering the well being of Black people. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two words, three words really meticulous work and centering that really stand out for me because when I think about meticulousness, I think about detail, attention to care, attention to practice. Um, when I think about work, I think about what Teresa has said about the actual work, like what it took and the strategies that had to be used. And I think about what Amanda was saying. And then I think about what does it look like to center? Um, and so that statement just really stood out for me. And I think, you know, I do a couple of different things, but the main thing that I think I actually do is practice. Like what's my practice is actually an inquiry-based approach, which is like, oh, so if we're going to do certain things in certain ways, then I need you to explain to me the conditions by which we are doing this and the why behind that. Um, my mom used to say to me all the time, I never grew out of asking why questions. And she would say to me, that's not very helpful. You need to actually ask how. Um, and so I think I became an academic so that I could unapologetically always ask why and then scuttle off to figure out how. Um, but the why and the how of how certain systems are in operation. So I think that's one of the things that I actually do is constantly asking, well, if we're going to say we, who is the we to whom we are referring? And let us define that. If we are saying, when I look at this, I feel this, who, why is that? And where is that grounded within? So I think an inquiry approach and really pushing people to think about why or how or the questions that are behind how they're doing certain things. And then I think I do descriptive practice. Um, I think uh, Dr. Morgan, the idea of refusal and removal 
but also in certain cases, I think I do descriptive practice. So I'm describing what is actually happening. And then I think also as a museum educator, I'm constantly thinking about when I'm with participants and we're looking at either a piece, a work of art or an object, how am I guiding the eye? How am I guiding the eye and disrupting the, the objectification, particularly of um, people of color and black people? And then what is the language and image that I use together? Mm -hmm. Right, so I do a tour where I go through the presidential portraits um, at the Nash, uh, the Smithsonian American Art Gallery and the National Portrait Gallery. And one of the things that I do is I talk very openly about George Washington as an enslaver. And I think that gets to the point that Dr. Morgan was making. You don't have to, um, you don't have to have a black figure in a work in order to talk about how blackness is being invoked. And then I think a lot about black aesthetic and placement, which is something that Brandy Thompson talks about. The use of black people or black aesthetics to signal coolness that are then put into racial capitalism and then used for people to signal their social status. So you don't really have to care about black liberation, but you can signal that care through the adoption of a black aesthetic and then use that to enhance status. So I think racial capitalism is really important. And what Teresa was saying about the hugging of a police officer that brings to mind that image for me of the Hart family that was out in the Pacific Northwest. And one of the little boys, he's never been found. Um, his body has never been found and he was adopted uh, by a white family. And because of the, the way that whiteness shielded accountability um, he was forced to hug this police officer, basically what we learned as a photo op. And then the abuse he suffered is totally lost, right? And that image becomes the image that's repeatedly used of him. So I, I'm also thinking about how do we teach ourselves to re-see and reframe? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. That was Daniel, I wonder if this connects to our, um, to our next to our next theme. Oh, but Kijo, before before we move on, um, Dr. Mobley, could you give us that reference to that book again that you mentioned, um, the about the um, black aesthetics, just real yeah. quick. Uh, black in Place, and it's by Brandy Thompson. Okay. And I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. I also wanted to offer the audience, I think connected to the tours that you're giving of the presidential portraits, Dr. Mobley, is like Titus Kafar's work. I'm thinking specifically of, um, uh, oh gosh, all of the titles are jumbling. He has um, an equestrian portrait of George Washington onto which he's nailed the, the names of his slaves in these strips of, of canvas using rusty nails, so also invoking in Kesey figures. Um, it's in Yale's collection. Oh, gosh. I'll find it, Kija. Thank you. Um, but just thinking about the works that we then uh, mm -hmm. speak to that can also, are doing some of that work um, that you're doing person to person um, in, the, in, in your gallery tours. Did you want to add something else, Latanya? Before I think that's good. I'll go ahead and find the Titus, but we can move on. I think it connects yeah. as well. Yes, beautifully, right? Because I think um, when we were thinking about how we imagine and build Black futures, a lot of the things that we talk about are um, uh, the kinds of um, ways that we are 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 in our own work, attempting to either unearth, explore make visible, right, these stories. But I keep returning to um, what Sarah Lewis wrote in um, her editor's uh, note in her, uh, in the Vision and Justice mm -hmm. edition of Aperture from a few years ago. Um, and I quote, understanding the relationship of race and the quest for full citizenship in this country requires an advanced state of visual literacy, particularly during times, during periods of turmoil. 
Today, we've been, witness, we've been able to witness injustices in a firsthand way on a massive scale that would have been unimaginable decades ago. Um, and we've had to ask ourselves questions that call upon powers of visual analysis. And she goes on to say that being an engaged citizen requires grappling with pictures and knowing their historical context um, at times with near our historical precision. And yet it's the artist who knows what images need to be seen to affect change and alter history, to shine a spotlight in ways that will result in sustained attention. So thinking about um, uh, what, what the world is asking of us, what the work is asking of us, like how it is that in our own work we are attempting to, so I will, as, exam as an example, um, uh, in my own work with students, um, we are spending an incredible amount of time with them having to prove whatever they say about whatever work, they have to prove it in the paint, prove it in the stone, prove it in the wood, whatever it is. You can't tell me nothing without proving it in the work itself. And that also includes my engagements with artists. You can tell me whatever you want about the work, but if it's if you can't tell me sort of where things are emerging, what's merging, what's happening, um, if it it doesn't mean that the work is is no longer um, um, vital. It just changes, I think, um, an element of my understanding. If you cannot uh, tell me how you understand the work um, in these really clear ways, so I think that what we were hoping is um, for each of you to sort of speak to how you think about um, what, what's being asked of us, right, as, as consumers of images or producers of images or teachers. Mm. And we'll let someone volunteer to go first. I don't want to just go. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, uh, the, the concept of the hold, you know, that Christina Sharp talks about in the wake and and the physical and psychological impositions that you know we as black and brown people experience, be it suffering, trauma, or at, in worst case, death, like we are constantly confronted with this. And each and every time that a black person is harmed, we are like re-held captive to that hold. And so it, it's, it's obvious that artists in their work would want to explore that because it inhabits us, it's within us. The issue is, is that when you're exploring it and you're not tying it to abolitionist principles or when you're not tying it to a desire to transform the system, right? Then, then you're reinforcing hegemony. You're reinforcing that structural racism. And so it's, it's not that black artists can never grapple with state sanction violence or police brutality. It's that it has to be intentional and it has to be towards our liberation, you know, because the hold, it stays and it increases. But as Sharp says, so does our language, so does our beholdingness to each other. That also needs to increase. And so I think that in this moment where Black death is all around us and very accessible on our, on our cell phones, right, like Susan Sontag says, like, um, it's, it's a part of the, the modern experience is to be a spectator, to witness these events. Um, but what does it mean to be a mourner? What does it mean to truly, truly grieve the death of our lost brothers and sisters due to state sanctioned violence? It means action and care. It means protecting the living community. It means providing aid to the families and the loved ones of that individual. And that means providing the counter narrative that the only thing that, the only thing in visual culture, um, death isn't the only thing in visual culture that can define us. We are not just hashtags and headlines. Those counter narratives allow us to not concede to defeat, but, 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 but to um, increase our efforts towards progress and towards liberation. And so we have to think about how were we actively engaging with these images? If we're just sitting there and looking at them and saying RIP and not doing the work of trying to dismantling, dismantle the systems that are killing these folks, then, then, then we're just merely spectators. I believe that mourning is a liberatory practice. And I think that we need to do more mourning and less spectating. Ooh. Yes. And I, I agree with 
um, Amanda, because in Portland this past summer, if at any other time, I'd never seen so much propaganda um, around the death of a black person in America. Like we had been begging people for 10 years. My nephew got killed in gun violence. And so that's what turned me kind of into a community organizer and activist, but I was really just seeking audits and policy change. Um, and when Trayvon Martin died, and then again, when, um, when Mike Brown died, people asked me to rally and organize people in the streets. And the only reason I would do it was the intentional focus of educating community on their interaction and the need for them to be civically engaged for these issues to stop being issues and to change the circumstance into um, a problem for the lawmakers and not for us to deal with as mourners. Um, and I'm still working through the trauma so seeing what happened with George Floyd this summer and how everyone, people that had never, um, people who had literally made a life work off of discrediting the work um, and the activism and the advocacy that we provide to our communities through the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, literally had platforms because of the work we were doing because they would not relate to it. Um, those same people being put in positions of power and to be pointed to as the voice of reason in these times when there is such so much work that got us to where we were to where opening up the doors to so much opportunity just it fell flat um, and that again it's intentional and I'm just wondering how do we stop that because even right now um, with everything that's happening you have the companies like you know we were talking about in the beginning of this that have made their corporate statements and are building on that framework um, and we know that whatever they adopt, even in the tagging of Black Lives Matter and using the hashtags, that it's not a long-term, um, you know, reparation. Um, it's not going to get us into reconstruction. Um, they're waiting for the 15 minutes to, to preside, but I don't think we're going back. Um, so I think that uh, recentering our efforts and even our, our resources to community what I've asked museums and museum workers to do is get fired. You know, like we now have the ability through having to fundraise for funerals, um, we can fund the programs and the necess necessary curriculums and, and efforts um, ourselves through our community, through the building of mutual aid. Um, like Dr. Amanda was saying, you know, taking care of each other has taken a toll to the point where we no longer have to go forward for grants. And we're not asking for people to die so that we can be the, the community organizers um, building this infrastructure, but the, the country we live in won't stop the murders. Um, so you have to stop participating in that system. We have to stop writing grants um, through organizations that are harmful, um, partnering in press releases with agencies that don't um, effectively communicate to our community and are literally using our proximity to the communication um, to undermine us at the same time that we're trying to center our community and to reinforce um, the need to stop the anti-Blackness. I mean, it's, it's very hard right now, but I think that where we are in the world and how we have a foundation that actually has critique, experience, skill sets, um, and we're not vulnerable right now. Like right now we're using our platform at a time where people are fighting to be heard, um, mm -hmm. but opening up that and seeing what type of power we have and making that institutional. Uh, making that a condition of our employment or our engagement. I've shut off a whole lot of centers. Um, I don't, you know, have any kind of interest right now in even doing business with the Portland Art Museum. Um, I'm kind of glad that my indigenous brothers, you know, reclaimed their, their heritage and their cultural um, pieces from that space. And I wish more places would find ways to fund a kiosk and, and privately run um, public access places in our communities led by Black people because the exploitation is real and at this point is violent. Yes, yes, it's all yeah. of that, all of that, what you just said. Um, we are kind of running short of time, unfortunately, and this is such a rich conversation. I do want to invite our other, um, you know, discussants to kind of chime in quickly. I, I want to hear your thoughts too. Um, so if you, if you have something to share, please, please come on in. Um, Kelly, you go. Go ahead. For um, to Teresa's point, you know about that violence. Um, you know, 
what I've done, I think most recently, I think there are various facets, you know, so my practice of various ways, you know, that I do this work. Um, but one of the one of the ways, you know, that I've really tried to um, affect that and like, in, you know, to Kijo, like the initial question, right? Like, how do we respond to the expectation? Um, I try not to. I try to make them respond to their own expectation. You know, and so so just for a quick example, like I did an, an, an entire gallery reinstallation about lynching, you know, that um, did not include a, an image of a dying, murdered black body. You know, it was ethereal white feminine nudes, you know, and a, a huge, beautiful, you know, Tiffany window <laughs> by Lewis Comfort Tiffany. Um, and, you know, going back to Sheila's earlier point, you know, it was not what they necessarily wanted to see because it was them looking at themselves. Um, and so I make them have to grapple with the fact that they have the expectations that they have of us in the first place. Right. Um, and I try to do that by literally just holding a mirror up to them. You know, <laughs> you know and it's interesting to watch them like flail around and, you know, fall all out on the floor like 12 year olds <laughs> when you do that. Because as a black person in the institution, as a black curator at that, it's like, I'm not doing what, you, what we hired you to do. Um, and I'm like, yeah, and why, and you know, your reaction, like you feeling that way is exactly like the point, you know? Um, and it's been, it's been fascinating, right? To do this work at three different institutions and have very, and basically get the same reaction, you know? So it's their, problem and it's like I try to make as as a curator you know I really try to make them own that um as white folks and a lot a lot of in most of the time they can't um and that's fine but I'm also like you know that's your problem to do that get a therapist find a psychiatrist figure it out like <laughs> you know that is not the work you know that I that I signed up to do um but it is something that I really like pride myself on doing so like Tanya was saying the disruption and the rupture is like sometimes you can only create that kind of cognitive dissonance for them. Um, and then you got to get out the way, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, but that's the way, you know, that I try to address it. I, that, that I've addressed it most recently, right? It's just kind of batting it back to them. Mm. Yes, all of that. Well, I would love to hear more about that show. I know we've talked about it a little bit, but that's, we have to get together again another time. Okay, but Sheila, Sheila, did you have an opportunity to chime in here? Sheila, you're on mute. Or yeah, I, I think um, I said what you know earlier on uh, about you know picking up on Dr. Kelly's um, about trying to show something different, you know, and how a lot of times um, the audience don't really want to face the reality of it. You know, so I, I don't, you know, like I said, I've been doing a lot of thinking about, especially as an image maker, because see, I've been out since 2013 photographing the movement. Mm -hmm. And I felt when George Floyd, I've been to internationally, nationally, I've been to universities talking about this work. And when George Floyd happened, I start looking at myself. I said, what am I doing? I'm showing this work, does it really matter, you know? And so, you know, when it comes to imagery and we live in a culture where we, how many images are uploaded in that we see and we become numb to those images. And I, I think about Roland Barth and he talks about the death of a photograph. And I think about the death of the video too, you know, because we become numb to all of that. So how can we, as the culture, and I keep saying this, is to elevate how to see and read these imagery because we always start with the end slaves, but do we go all the way back to Africa? That's not a culture that we don't know. We don't really know that culture. So I don't know, it's just a lot of, that's been on my mind about that with black pain, trauma, what's, you know, even in our DNA, I started looking at Harriet Tubman, you know? and started thinking about all of the trauma that was bestowed on her 
And I'm thinking about us as daughters of the enslaved and how it's installed on us, but we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. But I don't know, that's what I'm, I'm trying to um, grapple with that. What, every, what each one of you are talking about, I'm as an artist, I'm trying to grapple with that and see how I could visually talk about that because we live in a culture of imagery. We don't really read a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 thank you. So this is like this ongoing work. And you know, Dr. Mobley, maybe you can chime in here and get us to thinking a little bit more towards those futures, right? We were we're we're constantly doing this retooling. Some of us are doing it, really doing it. Some of some people aren't. But you know, those of us here are doing that work of um, you know that meticulous care. And I'd like you to maybe you know if this feels right to you, but to think like a little bit more towards getting us to those black futures that we're, we've been always imagining. Can I ask this first? When you say black futures, is it something that we're gonna reimagine and using psychology with that? Cause I've been thinking about that a lot. Cause you know, the book came out called Black Futures. Yes, it yeah. did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> I think so. You know, I, I just do wanna also pause. Um, I started out this day really thinking about Brandon Bernard who was executed last night at 9.27 oh, yes. p.m. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the circulation of Black death and um, how the announcements were made over Twitter, um, but also thinking about when we think about imaging Black death and there is a resistance. So for instance, if I go into a museum or I'm talking about a piece or even in my own um, academic work, I am a visual culture scholar. And so that involves the image, but I often withhold the image. So for instance, mm -hmm. I work with an image of Millie and Christine McCoy, who were two enslaved, uh, born enslaved Black women who um, were photographed throughout their, their life. And um, I withhold the full image of their body, right? Their bodies very intentionally. And then often I'll hear people when I'm giving tours say, well, but Mammy Till Mobley showed us Emmett Till, as if that was a totally unconditional sharing of her son's death. Um, and that image is not unconditional. It was shared very strategically. And if you go to see um, Emmett Till's coffin at the National Museum of African American History and culture, right, you can't take pictures there. So this sort of way, and I think it goes back to what um, Amanda was saying and what Teresa was saying, and I think what Dr. Morgan is saying is this idea of the expectation of spectatorial violence on the bodies of Black people, and that we are normalized into the expectation of that spectatorial violence, either through lynching photographs or the circulation of George Floyd's death, or all of these different um, circulation of images that we get normalized to expect it and to be spectators to that death. So part of the work of art history and visual culture, I think, is encouraging people to look closely, but not at the site necessarily of the most obscene violence, but how that violence is allowed. And if we're thinking about moving into the future, part of what moving into the future might be is really equipping ourselves with different kinds of critical strategies for looking that bring us healing, that deconstruct images, um, and that resist spectatorial violence. And let me say one thing based on what you just spoke about. Um, Latanya, the imagery of the mothers, I did a portrait of mothers uh, whose children have fallen from police brutality. Um, Eric Garner's mother, Oscar Grant, Tamir Rice, and mothers from Atlanta. And I really, with that image, of their portrait, I really wanted to talk about their self-care. And I had so much trouble getting it up because of the black body it has always been politicized. They, I, it was hard for me to get it up in Atlanta and I was kind of blown away with that too. I don't know if everybody has seen that image at all. You have, yeah. We had it at the, it's at the beginning of the opening of the um, Teach In Today's so scrolling through the images. And I was talking about Black futures, about moving on, about reimagining 
with that, but I got a lot of slack from that. Yes, because I showed an image of the photographer, Richard Averdon, where he was holding. If you could share my screen, I could show it to everybody real quick, um, Latanya. I don't know. Can someone allow me to share my um, share the screen? Okay, well, let's see if I um, and let somebody else talk and then I could share it so they could see the two images together on the wall on, you know, on the building. Yeah. So the one thing that I will also see is when I think about imagining black futures, I think also mm -hmm. with the indigenous belief of seven generations. So you're organizing for the seven generations that came behind you and the seven generations that will mm -hmm. come ahead of you. And so thinking about and it's a Haudenosaunee uh, cosmology about how we imagine our space and place in the work that we do. So I, when I imagine Black futures, I never imagine that without bringing um, the ancestral wisdom that we have to imagine mm -hmm. a future, right, for ourselves. It's really that does not abandon the places that we have been, but brings them along and creative and imaginary ways and that teaches us to organize and imagine differently and this is the image that i was talking about it's moving on in the black futures of the women yes mm. yes 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 such a beautiful diptych here um definitely and and you know um, this is wonderful, and I'm glad you brought this up again, uh, or brought this up, Sheila, because um, you know the mothers here, and you know seeing them contrasted the futures, like seeing Julian Bond holding his daughter, right, and right. All the organizers behind him, and seeing you know today our contemporary moment and these um, these mothers, these activists, and um, everything together. And I think there's also Dr. Rosalind Pope. Um, also. Dr. Rosalind Polk, who authored The Appeal of Human Rights, she was the age of 20, I believe, went to Spelman College and wrote um, The Appeal of Human Rights. This mm. is in Atlanta. Right, downtown Atlanta, beautiful mural. And also um, Ms. Samaria Rice, who was with us for our opening day, she is also in this image too, over on the um, far right in black. And um, really thank you for, for bringing her back. And, you know, for really for all of you, for what, what you've done today is so, um, so wonderful. I will get some comments together, but real quick, I actually want to unfortunately break this conversation that we've been having. I don't want to stop really, but, um, you know, because of our schedule we got here, I do want to um, bring on Casey Barge, who is oh. with me. He is going to share some music. And um, then I'll come back and do a formal thank you to all of you and to all everyone here today and give some more information. So please, um, let's welcome Casey Barge. He's an alternative songwriter, performer, and entrepreneur. He co-founded Aloof All, All's Lost Outside Our Fantasy Recordings. It's a creative, collective, and independent music label that um, was based here in Cleveland. And it, it's about working towards the social and environmental transformation he is also the co-founder of Safe Space Productions. Casey, someone I got, I was lucky, lucky enough to meet when I um, moved here last year and I just keep learning and I'm just so impressed by his music. And um, thank you for joining us, Casey. Oh, love, love. And I appreciate you for having me. And I am honored to be amongst you beautiful queens and strong queens having this conversation and figuring out ways that we can move past what we've been going through for so long. Um, I just wanted to add on to what everyone has been saying. I feel that like it's very important that we do step on these, um, these traumas and these move past these fears and um, be more, you know, more um, optimistic and reach for a, you know, a brighter future. And yeah, so all that to say, the words that I'm going to share today, I feel like they're adding on to what you all have already said in a more poetic way. Um, I unfortunately wasn't able to set up the live instrumental uh, setup and backgrounding that I would like to but I still wanted to share these words because I was asked to. Um, these words mean a lot to me because when I do write, 
And when I did start to write, it was a form of expression and it was the way that I found comfortable to express myself. I wasn't always as vocal, but music and uh, poetry, it just helped me in that way. Peace, love, I welcome you with open arms. No matter how much you've heard that lately, fear still lingers on. And I know it's genocide, that's not just on your mind. They killing us on the daily, but when will we resign? I came to fuck shit up a bit. Pure soul, they hesitant, let them know we haven't sent. Divine beings remembering all that I've seen. Risk everything and leave it all for my young king. In fact, make sure I make enough so it's hereditary. Came for all you owe, motherfuck the confetti. And you're hitting agendas, power hungry binges. Nothing you can sell me, I'll never surrender. Give a fuck about what they tell me. Stole my people happiness and sold it back in luxury. Ironic how we rise above while going through it. We put our life in these lines. This ain't just music. <clears throat> I know life at times can get confusing. One sick movie, so much time feeling down, seem like can't win for losing. No role models and constant search of guidance at every single function, getting lost, trying to find it. Yeah, blunt after blunt, pour another cup. Ain't that how it go? Need a little more love and trust in self just to let go. I've grown to learn a lot of people, close-minded, judgmental. Remember, we walk a different path. Never know what the next person's been through. Lead by example, shine a little light. In the end, if we got each other, everything I right. Serpents lurk and find your purpose and show others the way. Sick of the sheep mentality, it's time to elevate. They use and abuse with lies, miseducate. But we are gods, no die, it's in our DNA. So shine bright like the light you are, promise you'll go far, find inner peace, grow in your being. This shit ain't what it seems. <clears throat> and love, love. And to go back to what I started on, love is one of the things that helped me find myself even more. Because growing up, I didn't have the best uh, role models or the best family structure, but uh, learning to love myself and learning to let go and forgive anything that I felt was holding me back, including myself, I felt helped me grow to the man that I am today and helping me be the best guy that I can for my young king. Uh, going back to the beginning again, love, I feel like will help us overcome anything that we're going through and to not dwell on anything that we went through in the past or even our ancestors, definitely be aware, definitely know what's going on. But fear is one of the things that they've used to control us for so long. And us moving past that as we are doing, and that's why I say this is so beautiful. This brings a smile to my face to see you all here working on ways that we can move past this. Uh, peace and love and yeah. Thank you for having me. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Casey, for that. And yes, that was really beautiful. I love that you were able to join us today. And that's a perfect way to sum up things. This wonderful discussion that we've had today, thinking about centering our bodies, bringing our hearts and minds, bodies and souls together with everything. Um, you know, what you were just saying about love is something that I, you know, I've been really kind of questioning what this work is, this work of being a curator and we know the word curator about QRA and about this idea of care. And usually it's traditionally talking about caring for objects, maybe caring for artists sometimes at contemporary institutions, maybe, I'll say it was maybe. But I'm thinking about, you know, the care, I was like, if we really have a critical kind of understanding of what that work is um, and also being black in white museum spaces, my work is different, right? So I've been able to really push, I've been pushing to understand what my work is in these white spaces and the work of collective care, thinking about the kind of, uh, you know, the roots that I've been brought up with. And I love how everybody was sharing, you know, about Toni Morrison. We are so many wonderful people. Lucille Clifton brought up, you know, Alice Walker, all of these wonderful folks, um, people's families, you know, knowing about the various family uh, from your biological family to, other people that are also part of the family, part of that network. Um, 
that's the kind of thing about care to me. So the care has been about the collective care, thinking very much about bringing, working with communities, right? Working with those, working with communities, thinking about bringing along the folks who have been most harmed, right? The people who have been most harmed, centering those people in the work. And all of that, and thinking about the Black radical imagination, as we have brought up in this discussion today, you really can't imagine our futures without love. And so it's something that I have been starting to really put together this um, just recently, that the work of being a curator should involve a love, a love of community, a love of people. And um, thanks to all of you today, really, I'm just, I can't hardly even really put together to sum up everything because I was just frantically writing notes here. But yes, um, we were, you know, imagining and really thinking uh, carefully about what it means to center us and how people are doing that in their, their work all of the time and that constant work of coming back to it and having to continue to think, how can we center us, believing in our futures, refusing to participate in the ongoing anti-Blackness, which is real, it is happening, it happened at all the time. Um, and as, uh, you know, Dr. Mobley brought up, you know, the, the recent execution of um, Brandon Bernard, it is ongoing, it is the wake that we are in. Um, Definitely centering us in this. Thank you to Sheila Pre Bright. Thank you, Amanda D. King. Thank you, Dr. Isetta Autumn Mobley. Thank you, Dr. Kelly Morgan. Thank you, Teresa Rafer. Thank you, Kijo Lee, for helping me out with all of this. And you ain't you ain't done yet. Uh, thank you, Amy Meredith Cox, who is also not done yet. Uh, she's gonna be back with us. And of course, Casey Barge, today our ASL interpreters, Patty Bettis Eddy and Rachel Parada. Um, have been here, our production team, Taya Spittle, Lauren Loving, Melissa Kansky, and Jen Cox, thanks to all of you. Our gathering, this teach-in, is a Black Liberation Center project. It's a Black Liberation Center project. It is in association with MOCA Cleveland and the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center. We will continue to add to, we have a, a list of educational resources that we're sharing on our website. It's called artofcollectivecare.com. Uh, we will continue to share educational resources there. So some of these references that you're hearing today and other things are on this, this list. Um, also, there will be recordings of our opening day and roundtables that will be available on the website. I can't promise exactly when. We're working on getting them all edited and everything. We hope that you will join us on Sunday, the 13th at 2.30 p.m. for our workshop, Build Your Practice of Collective Care. So Kijo and I will be back with you and we will be working with participants of the workshop to strategize methods for applying collective care to various real world professional scenarios. Um, that session will be open to anyone who has attended the, the December 11th roundtable. So if you are here today, you're welcome to join the workshop. We are, you know, basically, we are really committed to building authentic, thoughtful, ethical practice and visual culture, to caring about those most harmed. And we hope this session and really all the sessions are helpful to you. After the teach-in, we will send all the registrants and evaluation form for feedback. And so please keep an eye out for that in your inbox and complete the form and send it to us. And, you know, let's change the world together. It's hard, but, we are out here and we got us, we got us. So keep, keep doing that work and keep believing in, in yourself and your future, your family, do that work. It is hard, but you know, just center that and remember you, we got us. So thank you. Wait a minute, something going.